Hi, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Oscar. I work on protocol research at Status. Um, I'm Dean. I also work on protocol research at Status. Uh, today, we're going to talk to you about VAC P2P. Um, so, VAC is a family of protocols for developing secure, private, and sensor persistent P2P solutions. What that means in practice for us at Status right now is essentially secure messaging. Um, when people talk about secure messaging, usually focus on sort of end-to-end -end encryption, forward secrecy, avoiding man and mill attacks, and so on. Um, but there's other security properties, such as privacy and predicting sort of uh, metadata, as well as sensor persistence. And altogether, these sort of uh, properties um, help you protect against various types of threat models that we see around the world today, as well as for certain high-risk individuals. So one way of looking at the problem of, of sort of secure messaging um, is in terms of a messaging stack, uh, where sort of each layer is roughly orthogonal to the other layers. So starting at the very top, you have sort of end user semantics. So that's your, uh, if it's some private uh, sort of encrypted group chat, or maybe some public um, forum with some moderation mechanism. And then below that, you have sort of the data consistency data sync layer, which ensures that sort of all the nodes have sort of the right idea of what the state of some context or conversation is. Um, and then below that, you have sort of your secure transport, um, which gives you properties like confidentiality, forward secrecy, and so on. Um, and right now, we use double register for that status, but there's others like message layer security. And below that, you sort of have the metadata protection layer, where right now we use whispered status, uh, but there's also other solutions like uh, PSS and Tor mixnets that are kind of different, but, but they, they share some common design goals, and they have various properties against various types of uh, threat models. And then below that, you have sort of the, the overlay network, overlay routing for net traversal, and sort of abstracting away the actual transports like TCP, UDP, and so on. Um, and this layer sort of helps a lot when it comes to sensor persistence, because this is where you sort of guard against uh, various types of traffic filtering, and so on. And there's a kind of somewhat orthogonal piece to that. You also have trust establishment, which is sort of how you establish end-to-end -end trust where there's various models like uh, trust and first use, uh, and web of trust like PGP and Keybase, and so on. Um, talking briefly about sort of some design goals we have at VAC, so we, we're trying to sort of create these, these interfaces at each layer, uh, where that allows for sort of existing and new protocols um, at each layer of the stack. Um, we don't want to reinvent the wheel here, because there's a lot of sort of protocols and components that are being developed for people at this conference, as well as sort of in adjacent ecosystems and communities. And sort of solve all of the problems. So it's more about sort of defining these interfaces and then allowing these very several protocols uh, to work together. Uh, and we very much sort of take the design philosophy from products like LeapP2P and Substrate in, in sort of enabling that and having kind of a protocol selection that depends on your specific design goals. So let's say you're extremely sort of privacy conscious, then you might want to use a mixnet uh, such as the one developed by NIM. But if you have different sort of constraints, maybe you sort of care a lot about bandwidth or, or, or latency or sort of sensor persistence, then you might want to have a different choice at that specific layer. Another design goal is in terms of uh, better specifications. Um, and for status, we started off with this sort of ad hoc protocol defining the app. Um, and now we're sort of moving to the more other extreme, where we sort of uh, look at a protocol as, it's, as an animal in its own right and uh, sort of trying to make it maximally useful for, for sort of other projects as well. And this also includes sort of making more rigorous analysis of the exact guarantees in behaviors of these protocols. Uh, another design goal is in terms of sort of um, providing the tools to do sort of simulation testing in both at scale and for adverse environments. And this is for things like uh, white block and Jepson simulation framework and so on uh, to make sure that the design actually makes sense and will scale to the, the sort of have the properties that we want at scale uh, so it doesn't sort of um, fall under, which is what we're seeing with, with some of the stuff we had in production with Whisper, for example. Another big one is in terms of uh, mostly offline. So when it comes to secure messaging and so on, often users are sort of mobile phones, and usually this is sort of an afterthought, and this leads to people accessing the network through gateways and so on. And we want to sort of think about this from the get-go. Um, because what makes mobile phones a bit special is that, for example, on iOS, you can't have... Um, 
battery execution is very limited. On Android, it's draining your battery. So you got to think about these things and how you actually sort of natively connect to the network and, and make sure things work properly with resource addicted devices. Uh, and finally, sort of a lot of people uh, use things like WhatsApp and, and Telegram and so on, and we do it internally at Steps as well. And, and uh, like people are not going to use this technology unless you actually enable an excellent use experience. Uh, so that's something you have to sort of, you have to make sure that you support the user stories for the end users, uh, for people to actually use this kind of stuff. Uh, with that, uh, Dean will talk a bit about our data sync layer. Yeah, so what we started off with at Status is a very naive Whisper transport. And Whisper comes with various issues in the way that messages are sent. They expire at a certain point. So we need to go to uh, save these messages on a mail server so that with mostly offline devices, a message actually reaches its um, destination user. So to solve for that, what we did is we built a data sync protocol on top of Whisper to already add more reliability guarantees uh, to the lower Whisper uh, transport layer. Um, this is a general problem in peer-to-peer -peer systems when you have unreliable transports where you need to add some form of synchronization protocol on top of it to ensure that we have these uh, availability guarantees which are usually only achievable through um, centralized servers. So how does this look? It's a very TCP-like inspired uh, protocol in that we now split up the way we send a message into multiple steps. What we initially do is we offer a message to a specific user. So Alice would offer a payload um, to Bob. And then once uh, Bob has received that message of the offer, he will request it from Alice. Alice then sends that message and Bob then uh, returns an act saying that he received this message. With e each of these steps, what happens is uh, things are retransmitted. So if Bob is offline when Alice is sending an offer, Alice will exponentially try and offer that message again and again up until it receives a request from Bob. And uh, that continues for every stage. So we, we know that this entire process has happened and that a message is transported in the end successfully because we've retransmitted it up until the next step. That's how the interactive mode works. That's like a very uh, bandwidth high version of the protocol. What we also have is the batch data sync mode. So here we don't have any offers. We don't have any requests. What we do here is we simply repeatedly send the message payload up until we have uh, received X. This is, sorry, this is the bandwidth high one. The other one just has a higher latency up until you've received the actual message because there's multiple steps in between. Um, this still has certain problems because it requires us to keep forwarding these messages repeatedly. So one way we can solve for that is we can add a remote log on top of the protocol, which Oscar will talk about. Uh, yeah, so, so the idea with the remote log is very straightforward. Um, you essentially have a, a local log where you sort of have your messages on a local machine and then you replicate it on some decentralized file storage. Um, and that acts as a kind of highly available caching layer. Um, so what you have is you have essentially two, two uh, new components. You have a CAS and then a name system. Um, and the CAS is a content addressable storage. And essentially you... you it, you upload some content and then you address it by sort of its content hash, so it's an immutable store. Uh, and the name system, that's something like a DNS or ENS or swarm feeds or uh, IPNS in the IPFS world. And it essentially gives you sort of location addressing or mutable references. Um, so when Alice, uh, sort of, they, they, they upload something to, to the CAS and they get back to address for it, and then they upload sort of the, the, the name system. Um, and then when, when Bob comes online, when he notes comes online, and they know about sort of this, this kind of conversation or this sync scope between Alice and Bob, they have a fixed point. They know that they can look at the name system, um, even with Alice being offline. Uh, so they check the name system, um, and they see what messages they've been missing, and then they can go to the, to the cast and, and get those uh, without Alice being online. Uh, in terms of data format, it's, it's very straightforward. It's essentially a mapping. Um, and it's just mapping from sort of the native message identifier, which is sort of what's determined by the upper layers, to the sort of address uh, at the at the CAS. 
Um, and then there's also sort of an address to, to the next page. So you essentially have these pages with, with logs, uh, because if you have a lot of sort of messages, you, you want to split that apart. Um, and there's an alternative. You can also embed the sort of actual uh, wire payload and encrypted content uh, in the name system as well. Um, and this is just kind of a trade-off in terms of what the name system, specific name system, uh, supports. Uh, so it could be a very small one, in which case you can't actually embed the content. Um, and then the trade-off is if you want to sort of traverse the link list and sort of go to the cast multiple times and so on. Uh, this is sort of a very general design, so it works, it works with Swarm, it works with IPFS, and also works sort of if you want to have it on a USB drive to the backups or any other sort of similar thing that implements these interfaces. Uh, in terms of privacy properties, this, this very much depends on the underlying uh, CAS. So if you have, for example, a mixnet and you do uh, posts or, or gets through the mixnet, uh, then you actually get send and receive anonymity that way. Uh, you can also do other things, like you can ratchet the, the name system, so you change the location of it, uh, kind of like how you do ratcheting in sort of forward secrecy schemes and so on. Uh, Dean will talk a bit about how we achieve certain consistency guarantees with the metadata format. Yeah, so a problem of all this messaging stuff is that uh, messages are usually related, and so we need some way to provide some form of consistency to these messages. Uh, so we need to be able to provide ordering amongst various messages, not only uh, a linear ordering through my messages, but we want some kind of DAG if I'm in a conversation where uh, messages are linked to each other to show what is the what message depends on what message. So here we have an example of this DAG where what we want is we want linear lists of messages saying, I sent this message before, this is the next message, and I keep linking the previous message that I sent. But what we then also start doing is we start linking uh, messages that other people have sent me. So I start linking the last seen message that I've received into uh, the next message that I'm gonna send. Um, and additionally, what we can start linking in is we can start linking in things like remote log information so that when we go to this log, we know exactly what position a message is placed at in this remote log. So that if I've missed, let's say, 10 messages before my last message, I know exactly which page to go to and from which um, message number to which message number to sync. And the way we do this is relatively easy right now. We just um, add a protocol buffer, essentially, to the message as a header, where we have a repeated uh, byte array of parents, which is just the parent IDs of messages. So that would be like messages that have been in this group context before my message. This can be messages I've received or messages I've sent. Then the sequence number, that is the one which relates to the actual uh, number we're seeing on the remote log. And then we have something like previous message, which is my last sent message. And additionally, we also add a, a Boolean to indicate whether a message is required to be act or not. And this is important for things like user typing notifications or that a user came online. Uh, those are things that we don't need to really be consistent about because if that message gets dropped, I don't really care. I'm not going to retransmit that. Those are like one-time notifications that I'm just going to send out. And if, if it's received, that's good. If it's not received, I don't really care because it's not important to the actual in a chat context conversation that is occurring. Um, cool. So in terms of, sort of problems and rough priorities, uh, so next steps. So our initial focus has been on data sync. Uh, there's still some things we have to improve with it, uh, specifically in terms of scalability and semantics for sort of large sync contexts. So imagine if you have a group with sort of a thousand participants, you want to reduce sort of the the chatter and sort of have efficient joining of, of logs so you don't sort of overwhelm the network. Um, another big sort of priority is in terms of better transport. Uh, so currently we use uh, Whisper and it sort of has a lot of issues when it comes to scalability and it's using proof of work for, for spam resistance, which is not great for heterogeneous uh, devices or nodes because your phone can easily be overwhelmed by someone spinning up an AWS node. And it's also not incentivized, so there's no reason to, to actually run the Whisper node, and it sort of doesn't map cleanly to the counting of the resources that you're actually sort of consuming and so on. So that's sort of in an, we're looking at various alternatives, and that's a very early research stage right now. Um, and related to that is also the, the sort of concept of adaptive nodes. Um, right now you have, generally speaking, sort of this 
this thing where you have full nodes that are sort of participating fully in the network, and then you have light nodes or even sort of gateways that are kind of like leeches, and, and they not, don't actually contribute to the network. And we think this is a bit backwards, because um, if you look at sort of more successful, uh, like, like peer-to-peer, a uh, BitTorrent as an example, as mo one of the most successful sort of peer-to-peer -peer deployments, uh, you actually always, everyone's contributing to the network and the health of the network. It's a very nice property, and uh, not everyone, will, all nodes will be able to contribute equally, but you sort of have the option to do that. Um, and this is something that Swarm is also working on, this sort of idea. And like, you can imagine that if you have a, a mobile phone with limited data plan, you probably aren't going to contribute to the network, so you might pay for it through some other means. Uh, but let's say that you, you, you have a, you come home and then you sort of plug in, you use Wi-Fi and you plug it in for charging, then you can sort of start to use that for relaying your messages. Or if you have an old laptop laying around, then you can use that to sort of store messages and help the network that way. So this idea of sort of creating a continuum between sort of light nodes and full nodes, where you sort of have some capabilities and you try to sort of contribute that to the network, to sort of make the network stronger. Uh, we think this, that's some sort of something we'll look into and we would love it if more people are also sort of thinking in these terms because it sort of creates for a better network in general and it's sort of also more in line with how we generally sort of see successful societies and systems where all nodes contribute to the extent that uh, they can. Um, so, yeah, that's it for us. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, and you can check out these um, websites where we have some research logs. You can read more in detail about uh, data sync, uh, remote log, and the general stack. Uh, we also have specifications. Um, and yeah, feel free to reach us, uh, us on Twitter. Um, yeah. Uh, where along in the, are you guys still in the research phase? Have you put a spec together? Where, when can we expect? Uh, yeah, so, so there are uh, specific there is a, for NVDS, that there's already a spec, and it's also in the it's status version one app. Uh, remote, uh, remote log, there's a spec and proof of concept. It's still not deployed in, in sort of the app. And then the other, other sort of products are still sort of in, in various research stages. Oh, and the metadata format is in spec and proof of concept stage, but not yet in, in the app. Uh, uh, there is some, um, not going to promise anything because that's also, it's sort of research. There's some interesting ideas when it comes to using uh, senior knowledge proofs and so on where you can sort of limit it that way, but it, it's, it's too early to tell if those things are actually, will actually work out, so we still need to, yeah, spend more time on that essentially. Uh, I would also point out that that's a specific thing for multicast networks as well, uh, where you sort of have this application factor, so for other types of networks that, that might not be as big of a problem, uh, but yeah. Any other questions? All right, cool. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>